And so today, the two questions we're going to answer about industrial microbiology is what is, the in, in, what is industrial microbiology and what are the main products of commercial uses of microbiology and microbes in general? What are some of the ways that these microbes are manipulated for an industry or applied biotechnology? And so this is sort of builds on all the things we've been talking about throughout the semester allowing us to see how microbes directly benefit from us. So I hope that from our human microbiome lecture, you, you have a pretty good and solid understanding of how microbes benefit you directly while living on and inside you. <clears throat> so when we're thinking about what industrial microbiology is, it's the commercial exploitation of microbes. And these typically fall into two broad categories. One is which is making things. These include food production and preservation, which we talked about in our last lecture production of industrial solvents and pharmaceuticals, and finally, the production of genetically modified plants. Secondly, we're particularly uh, interested in using microbes for removing things, so particularly thinking about this concept of bioremediation, which is anytime you use life to um, get rid of a problem that you have, say such as an industrial uh, waste spill or maybe like an oil spill. Um, and we also heavily rely on microorganisms for wastewater treatment. And so we're thinking about making things with microbes. Uh, microbes act essentially like a tiny factory for us, and they produce a lot of a specific molecule. Now, we need to remember that microbes themselves are basically uh, black boxes, right? Stuff comes in, stuff comes out, a bunch of stuff happens in between, but that's all microbes really are. They're, they're metabolism machines, and we can take advantage of their metabolism, we can take advantage of their genetics to allow us to make things or make a very specific molecule. And we've been using microbes to do this for millennia. And so we talked about ethanol fermentation. So this is something that's been going on for potentially tens of thousands of years, depending on who you ask. Um, we also use microbes to make nitrogen. Um, so we use them to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. This is, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. And we've also been using microbes to make solvents and pharmaceuticals, something we've been doing for the past few decades. Oops. And there are two fundamentally different sources of products. Um, the first being clone genes from human, animal, or plant sources, or native microbial products. So one being where we take something from a different animal or a different organism, stick it inside of a microbe to make it, or something microbes naturally make on their own. And we've been using a wide variety of different products produced by microbes, um, as well as uh, other organisms, um, for many, 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 many years at this point. And they include sort of a broad scope um, topics such as insecticides, vitamins, solvents, antibiotics, and drugs. And so this is just a nice table summarizing a sort of a very short list of the things that we use on a given basis, um, whether you know it or not, um, that, are, that are essentially produced from microbes. And these are you know, things that you might not think of such as fungicides or insecticides, but we do benefit greatly from those in our agriculture. Um, enzymes like lactase or lipases to break down things um, that help along in the manufacturing process. Um, food supplements such as tryptophan, vitamin Bs, vitamin Cs, again, all have microbial sources. Uh, fuels such as uh, potentially if you use uh, a nail polish remover like acetone um, or some other solvents. Um, we also rely on methane produced by microorganisms in the form of natural gas to power our, our homes off most often. And there's a whole list of things including antibiotics, organic acids, other pharmaceuticals, and uh, in particular, thinking about one of the most important things that has ever come out of the use and the production of microbial derived things, which is insulin. Um, so we use, in, we use recombinant E. coli to make insulin. So really important list of things. Um, it's certainly not the only list of things that these microbes do, but I hope you get a great appreciation for all the amazing things microbes produce from us on industrial scales. So first we're going to start off with talking about vitamin B12 because um, it's sort of an interesting thing with B12. We as humans have lost the capacity to synthesize vitamin B12 throughout evolution and history. And this is simply because we rely on our endogenous and exogenous microorganisms to provide B12 for us. As such, we rely solely on our food and we rely solely on our, our microbiota to give us vitamin B12. And thus the genetic capacity exists in nature for the production of vitamin B12. And, and so we're using this at an industrial scale to have microbes make products for us. And B12, um, if you've never sort of taken a deep dive into what it does, it's important for cellular metabolism, DNA synthesis, the production of myelin, um, which is important for muscle movement and regeneration, and as well as the maturation of bone marrow. And it's a really, really common component of multivitamins. So if you've ever taken a multivitamin throughout your years, um, I know when I was a kid, I used to eat the Flintstones uh, multivitamins, and uh, I, I know those are chock full of vitamin B12. 
But when we're thinking about um, omnivorous organisms, so organisms that eat, eat both plant and animal-based proteins and um, diets, um, they typically have no problems getting sufficient uh, B12 from their diet, but it's actually something that's particularly difficult for vegans, which actually need to take supplements. And so the industrial production of vitamin B12 is actually achieved through the fermentation um, by a several, several bacteria, including Streptomyces, which we talked about in the soil lecture, Propriani bacterium, where we talked about in um, how acne is formed. This is a bacteria that causes acne, and as well as Pseudomonas denitrificans. So this is a bacteria we talked about in the soil lecture, and we've talked about as a pathogen as well as in biofilm production. And this is, we produce vitamin B12 in tens of tons globally per year. You don't need very much B12, you know, you're talking about milligrams. So we produce a lot of vitamin B12 industrially. Um, in addition, we're using uh, our microbes to produce solvents. So for instance, acetone, butanol, ethanol, or ABE fermentation, which is carried out by members of the genus Clostridia. And so we talked about um, fermentation during the food microbiology lecture, as well as the metabolism lecture. And there are many sort of different properties you can take fermentation, but ultimately you start with the sugar and you go through a stepwise process in glycolysis to produce pyruvate. And then you use that pyruvate in one of two ways. You convert it first to acetyl-CoA, and then um, you can go through a pathway to produce acetates or go through a path to produce ethanol. So this is what we, we talked about when we talked about ethanol fermentation. You can continuously go down, transforming it into a different compound, eventually making acetone. Um, you can keep, keep on going and going and going. Eventually, you can produce butanol or butyrate. And so uh, this is actually a huge deal in World War I. And so we use solvents, in particular this ABE fermentation, um, as a component of explosives for the British. Um, and bacterial fermentation was actually the main source of these solvents until the 60s, uh, early 60s or so, when actually petroleum became a much more viable and more cost-effective way to make these products. Um, and uh, just as a note, the last production plant that used fermentation of these solvents actually closed in 2019 of last year, uh, June of 2019, so of last year. And so this was actually a much more uh, uh, less harsh way of producing these important solvents. And just the, sort of a note of what we think about with a solvent, something essentially to dissolve things into. And so this was a much actually environmentally friendly way to make these solvents. It's slightly more expensive than say using petroleum, but it is actually much more environmentally friendly um, than getting it from petroleum. Because petroleum is a really dirty, nasty thing from the environment as a whole. Um, so pharmaceuticals are next up. And so um, the very first sort of instance of using uh, microorganisms to produce pharmaceuticals was actually for the production of penicillin. So it's a byproduct of the fungus, uh, the genera fungus called penicillium. Uh, penicillium is a really interesting group of fungi because they're soil microbes, uh, but they're also responsible uh, for, the, for the fermentation processes that happen on cheese. Um, so if you like camembert or brie, it's actually carried out by uh, penicillium. And so what they would do, they would grow huge batch cultures, uh, three to three to one hundred, thir sorry, thirty to one hundred thousand gallons of this fungus, and um, and they would essentially extract penicillin. And so the yields of, um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of yields of penicillin from a single one of these batch fermentations, originally started off at about, about 0.15 grams per liter. Um, we now have improved the yields to about 50 grams per liter of culture. So that's a pretty dramatic improvement. Um, actually, the annual uh, bulk production of penicillin is about 33 million pounds with annual, annual market sales of more than 344 million. So we typically think of pet we typically think of penicillin as being an older antibiotic, but it's actually still highly effective at treating many, many types of infections, including syphilis. And so it is still a really important antibiotic, even though it's sort of a, a particularly old one. You know, at this point, it's about uh, what, uh, 90 years old. So it's a really old antibiotic, but it's still really important. But the idea, the way this works is you have this penicillium mold. Um, and this is what penicillium looks like. They are pretty cool and beautiful to look like. Um, you'll commonly see penicillium as green growth or sometimes white growth on your fruits if you leave them out for a long enough time. Um, as I mentioned, penicillium are very, very common. Um, but what we would do is we grow these penicillins in deep fermentation tanks by adding very specific types of sugar and other ingredients, which increase the growth of penicillium. And then what they did, um, uh, because penicillium will produce um, penicillin, penicillin, penicillin naturally, they would separate the penicillin product from the mold itself, and then they eventually purify it as an antibiotic. But it did all start with these huge batch scale fermentation tanks. <clears throat> 
Um, insulin is also another way we actually make um, a product through the, the processes of microbes. And this is actually produced by genetically modified E. coli or sometimes yeast, in particular Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and so the E. coli are transformed with a plasmid containing the gene for human insulin, and they're grown in actually very large batch fermentation cultures. Um, it was actually kind of interesting the way we used to get insulin is uh, historically speaking before we could genetically engineer E. coli what we would actually use is we would use pig pancreases and we would basically extract and squeeze out all the insulin we could uh, from pig pancreas to pig pancreases to administer to humans um, and it was sort of a, a, a gamble because you didn't know how strong the insulin would be coming out of pancreases because insulin has varying levels of, of uh, efficacy depending on which organism you get it from. And I, I mean organism as in like which type. So like if you get it from me versus you. And so sometimes people's insulin are stronger or weaker depending on who they are. And so by switching from this pig pancreas, which had a very variable amount of, of sort of strength um, from, from pig to pig even, to E. coli, we can actually get a much more consistent and much less variable product of insulin, which is really good for those getting those that are suffering from diabetes. And so, in addition, we keep, we actually been using bioreactors for quite a bit. And so, when we're thinking about how we make many products, they're through a process um, by using a bioreactor because we need to keep these microbes happy and growing at a certain stage. And so, when we're thinking about what stage we want these microbes to grow in, we were typically keeping them at log phase or stationary phase. This is typically when they're going to produce things at the most efficiency. So, and so, what we've done was we designed these bioreactors to keep these microbes um, essentially at these two phases. But the idea being is they pump new media and nutrients into these tanks. They have a, a rotator system that keeps things suspended and things from um, essentially from falling to the bottom and essentially stagnating. They have an air pump to keep oxygen flowing because you do not want these tanks to go anaerobic, which they will if you do not oxygenate them. And then we have a bunch of sensor probes to monitor all the conditions. And there's a thermal jack jacket to keep the temperature essentially um, consistent. And then eventually you have an effluent out pump that would essentially remove old media um, and dead things. So keep the system going, going and going and going. The idea being is you can keep these microbes happy, you can keep them producing your industrial product at an uh, increased rate. But ultimately, as you keep this going, the product that you're interested in are essentially, they will build up and eventually you have to extract and purify this effluent that comes out of here, getting your product at the end. And we can actually keep these products and these bioreactors running indefinitely if it is done right. And so bioreactors can vary from size. And so when I was a, when I was a graduate student, we, uh, there's a lab next to us that had a tabletop uh, bioreactor. Very, very simple, very, very small. They're about a foot or so tall. Um, but they can scale up to be hundreds of gallons, as you see here on the right. And there's a wide range of what they look like in terms of bioreactors. And clearly, as you go from small to big, they get much, much more expensive. Um, but it ultimately depends on what you're trying to produce. Large reactors are particularly good for commercial use, whereas something like, you know, a tabletop one is really good for sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of basic scientific use. Um, and so again, as you mentioned, you can use bioreactors to produce a wide variety of things, antibiotics, solvents, and pretty much anything you can think of that is a microbial product can be produced in one of these bioreactors. Um, next up is actually biopesticides, and these are biological agents, thinking particularly about bacteria, but sometimes fungi and viruses, um, or their components, which can be used to kill a susceptible insect. And so here's just a sort of really nice table that has some bacteria, virus, and fungi, and there's some major fun fungi and bacteria and viruses that are associated with um, biopesticides. And biopesticides just simply is, again, biological agents that we can use to control pesticides in an agricultural um, setting, Partic principally think about an agricultural setting, setting could be used in, you know, say, a, a, like a home setting, but think, uh, principally we're thinking about agricultural settings here. And so one of the most common bacteria that we use, and one that you've probably heard of before, actually comes from Bacillus thuringiensis. And so this is a bacteria. Um, we've worked with, in the lab, we've worked with this genus Bacillus. So we worked with Bacillus uh, subtilis, as well as Bacillus megarium. And uh, so that's the genus Bacillus. But Bacillus thuringiensis is actually, there are about, you know, uh, several dozen strains of this bacteria, and they've known to produce over 200 different types of Bt toxins, and each are harmful to different types of insects. So this is a behavior that was evolved by these bacteria to allow them to essentially stave off predation from um, or infect 
insects as a whole, but um, you've probably heard of Bt before. The Bt simply comes from Bacillus thuringiensis, so Bt. Um, you've probably heard of Bt corn. Um, so sort of this is something that gets a lot of flack um, as in terms of uh, genetically engineering crops, uh, but to be resistant to this toxin. But it is something that um, is really common in the agricultural world. And so what's kind of interesting about uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, it has what we call a paras uh, parasporal body. And so this is, it produces spores, it produces endospores, but it also has this parasporal, uh, parasporal body. And uh, what ends up happening is that when this bacteria is sporulating, again, producing an endospore, um, it, it essentially uh, it essentially creates this paraspor parasporal body as an intercellular protein toxin crystal. And so we're thinking about um, what this looks like. That's a parasporal body. Um, this is what the toxin crystals ultimately look like. And what it does is it actually acts as a microbial insecticide for very specific groups of insects. And so what this does is it, if, it, if this bacteria is then ingested by an insect, you'll see that um, what it does is it causes swelling of the gastrointestinal line and of the insects that has ingested it eventually leading to these, these uh, insects to be killed. And so we've developed in this insecticide. Again, it's just called, they're called BT insecticides. We've been using them for over 40 years. And, the, and uh, sort of one of the interesting things about these insecticides is that they actually do not accumulate in the environment. They actually degrade over time. So it's something like, um, many of you might have heard of uh, DDT, which is a pesticide that was used about the time of World War II. That's something that hang, hung around in the environment for decades before it eventually decomposed. Um, but BT actually will decompose within a year or so. So it doesn't hang around in the environment. It doesn't build up in soils. It doesn't build up in tissues. It goes away really quickly, which is why it's a really good um, biopesticide as a whole. Um, and so it's actually kind of interesting the way this works. So in an alkaline environment, the insect midgut actually dissolves um, the BT crystals. And so this is our parasporal crystal. Uh, crystal. Most insect guts are alkaline, meaning they have a pH above seven. What this ends up doing is it dissolves them um, <clears throat> into sort of little smaller components. Um, and what this does, um, it, it uh, the, the proteases of insects actually activate the toxin. And what this ends up doing is that the toxin will ent eventually enter the cell uh, membranes and form pores, essentially splitting this, uh, this cell membrane apart. And essentially what ends up happening is that the cells lose membrane potential and fill with water, um, causing them to lyse. So this is sort of the mechanism by which these BT toxins work. Particularly cool. Um, <clears throat> And so we've actually, um, because of the efficacy of BT as a, as a um, biopesticide, we've genetically engineered crops to produce BT toxins on their own. And you've probably heard of this as BT corn or potentially BT, to or BT cotton. But um, what, essentially these um, plants arose because we took the bacillus genes and added them directly to the plant's genome. And I just want to sort of just take just a brief moment here to just recognize the importance of genetically modified crops. They are super duper important. They allow for cheap production of food and they are completely in 100% safe. Genetically modified crops, no matter what anyone tells you, are perfectly safe to eat. They're perfectly safe to grow. Um, please do not believe any of the uh, misinformation out there about these crops. They are, they are super important and they're going to be incredibly important going forward, um, particularly thinking about as this planet gets hotter and drier, um, us being able to genetically engineer crops is going to be really important to help feed people. And it's also really help for, helpful right now for us to feed people because genetically modified crops are much easier to grow overall. So the question we can ask is how do we genetically modify a crop? Well, we can use microbes. And I, I think that's pretty, uh, that was, that was, you know, pretty obvious that was coming down the pipeline. And so we've actually talked about this micro microbe before, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. Agrobacterium as a genus is a ubiquitous soil-borne pathogen, which is responsible for crown gall disease, which is infects over 600 species of plants. This is what a crown gall looks like. Um, it also can happen below the surface of the plant. And the way this microbe works, and as we've talked about previously, it essentially infects the plant, injecting a DNA into the plant, causing an infection. And so essentially it pushes its genome into the plant, essentially hijacking the plant, sort of like a virus does. Um, I just also want to note that Agrobacterium, while it, the genus has is, is historically been known as soil pathogens, we do know that they are beneficial to many organisms out there. <clears throat> 
But ultimately, this is an example of um, <clears throat> the only known example of interkingdom DNA transfer. Because again, it's coming from a bacteria injecting into a plant, genetically modifying the plant. And so we've take, we take advantage of agrobacterium's desire to infect plants with its own genetic material to actually genetically engineer some of our own crops. Um, ultimately, the, the, I will note that the relationship between acrobacterium and many plants seems to be commensal because the plant derives actually no benefit from the presence of the bacteria, while the bacteria does derive a great deal of things from the plant. And ultimately, DNA transfers from agrobacterium to invasions to the plant. Again, only known example of interkingdom DNA transfer. And ultimately, we've, you, we've derived this natural process to use to alter plant genomes to create those GMOs or genetically modified organisms. But the idea being here is if we have an ag agrobacterium, if we have a gene of interest, what ends up happening is that agrobacterium will bind to the plant, inject that recombinant DNA into the plant. It gets incorporated into the plant's chromosome causing a change in the plant in some way, shape, or form. This is the most simple way to think about it. Bacteria binds, in fact, transforms the plant, very much like we talked about in the horizontal gene transfer lecture. Um, because of how simple this is and how very uh, sort of how good agrobacterium it is at affecting a wide variety of plants, it is actually widely used for, as a natural cloning vector for the introduction of foreign genes into plants. And there are many, many G GM plants out there that we use um, in our everyday life. You may not know it, but these include cotton with herbicide, uh, herbicide detox genes to allow us to spray more um, uh, pesticides on them without any deleterious effects to the cotton. Uh, soybeans with lower saturated fat content, which is good for people that suffer from uh, potentially heart disease or any other heart complications. Um, uh, rice with more iron and beta carotene. This is what we call golden rice. And so these, these are all sort of three major crops that we use um, oftentimes on an everyday basis and we don't quite realize it. But again, all derived from agrobacterium tumefaciens here. In addition, we've actually been using microbes as well as agrobacterium to infations to um, allow plants to fix nitrogen. So as we've talked about, um, plants and every organism on this planet needs nitrogen. You need it because it's an essential, integral part of your DNA and proteins. Nitrogen is the, uh, arguably the second most important compound in your body. Um, but um, what we but prior to the invention of what we call the Haber-Bosch process, which is large-scale nitrogen, which is large-scale industrial-based nitrogen fixation, so um, in a, in a factory essentially, um, large-scale nitrogen fixing so fixation and the production of fertilizers was actually only my, a microbial product. And as we talked about in our symbiosis lecture, in these root nodules, this is where we would see it. These root nodules housing nitrogen-fixing bacteria like rhizobium, like agrobacterium. Um, this is where bacteria be housed. And we talked about this in the symbiosis lecture, but I'll just reiterate, this happens in leguminous crops, particularly thinking about alfalfa, soy, and clover. And what we've been using for decades is actually using um, these microbes and these symbioses to replenish soils that have been farmed before. So the idea being is we can say, um, have a sort of a, just a sort of a basic example here where we have a very poor outcome of weeds in this agricultural field. If we grow, say, corn over the course of four years, we have a decent outcome of weeds. If we grow coin, soybean, coin, corn, soybean, a better outcome if we alternate between corn, wheat, soybean, corn, wheat, soybean, or the best outcome would potentially be corn, wheat, soybean, alfalfa. And the sort of the difference between here is that these soybeans and alfalfa will actually replenish the nitrogen in the system. Um, whereas corn can't do that, soybeans do it, but they're not as good as alfalfa. And so you, what you can do is essentially use crop rotation, so rotating how you plant your crops over the years to essentially restore nitrogen to these systems to prevent, say, weeds from coming to, to give you higher yield of crops. Um, and it's also a much more sort of environmentally friendly way of adding, adding nitrogen to the system, because otherwise you have to just dump a ton of um, fertilizers on your crops. Um, so in addition, we've been using microbes to make things that are important for microbes, I'm sorry, that are important for us commercially. And these are products that you might not think of, but they are products that are used globally. And they represent billions of dollars of economic um, um, products year after year after year. And they're often produced um, molecules that can only be made via microbes or something that would be a huge pain in the butt to generate via a chemical synthesis. Um, <clears throat> The question is, can they get rid of things? And obviously the answer to that is yes. 
And so we've been using microbes um, for bioremediation, essentially using microbes to alter the environmental conditions to stimulate the growth of, um, I'm sorry, altering my environmental conditions to stimulate the growth of microorganisms that degrade or re remediate target pollutants. This is really um, handy for things like petroleum, phenols, and polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, as well as heavy metals, including cadmium, chromium, lead, and uranium. And the idea being is we can use, we can use um, specific um, conditions to um, stimulate the growth of microbes. And so uh, one of the ways we actually can see this happening in real time is in a process called uh, permeable, permeable reactive barriers. Um, when I was in graduate school, I had a, a, a friend that worked on these permeable reactive barriers, but they're really, really cool. And so the way these work is they, these barriers, they're substrates that are useful for the target microbe to metabolize the target pollutant. And so typically these barriers are made up of organic carbon, thinking particularly about just wood chips. And the idea being is if you have waste that is flowing through the groundwater, it passes through one of these permanent reactive barrier. Because we've given these microbes a nice happy home and we've given them all the things that they want, they treat the water that's coming through. So by the time the water exits the barrier and enters, say, the ocean, the water will be fully treated and will be removed of any um, essentially non-essential, or I'm sorry, um, any of these harmful toxins. Again, this is a process we call bioremediation, using microbes to remove things from the environment that are potentially deleterious. Um, in addition, we've been using microbes to um, uh, catabolize or break down aromatic things. And so um, aromatic things are typically of large compounds, typically ringed um, in structure. And we've been using the uh, capacity of bacteria such as Rhodococcus and Pseudomonas to degrading these particularly um, hard to degrade aromatic carbons. Um, and these aromatic compounds are eventually converted to pyruvine, which is then used for energy. And so if you remember the end product of glycolysis from a metabolism lecture uh, is pyruvate. So they can use the pyruvate in any other process in their metabolism. But this allows the growth in a wide range of environments for these microbes. And we use them for the bioremediation of oil spills, industrial sites, as well as degrading toxic compounds. And so this is a really handy way to use microbes to get rid of industrial derived things. Um, in particular, thinking about aromatic things like big hydrocarbons like petroleum um, or potentially ring things like say benzene. Um, <clears throat> we also can use microbes to clean, clean up nitrogen pollution. Um, and so when lots of nitrogen enters a system, particularly thinking about places like the coastal, say like Boston Harbor, um, this leads to a process called eutrophication. Um, and eutrophication is essentially when uh, we essentially overstimulate um, the microbes present, in particular the photosynthesizers in a given ecosystem, causing a huge disruption in how that ecosystem functions as a whole. But ultimately, um, nitrogen pollution typically derives from natural and especially anthropogenic sources, including farming, farming as well as uh, septic systems and uh, wastewater offshoots or potentially drainage from sewers. Um, they ultimately end up in the coastal ocean. And all this excess nitrogen acts as fertilizers and causes algae to grow, causing what we call algal blooms. You might have heard of algal blooms before. This is just sort of a sad case of an algal bloom. It's particularly severe overgrowth of microorganisms. Um, and you can see this on not so happy um, Asian woman here, I'm sorry, this Asian girl here inside this really nasty algal bloom. Um, but ultimately, as this algal bloom grows and grows and grows, it eventually will run out of nitrogen because there's not an infinite source of nitrogen coming from our populations. And eventually all this algae start to die, or starts to die. And when, when the algae starts to die, the microorganisms will start to eat this algae. And once they start eating this algae, they start consuming all the oxygen. And once they start consuming all the oxygen, it will eventually drive that oxygen down to essentially zero, leading to these systems becoming anoxic. And essentially, once they become anoxic or free of oxygen, it results in what we call dead zones. And once you have dead zones, the, the idea being is one, things that need oxygen, say fish or crabs, or potentially even plants, will eventually die out because the microorganisms themselves consume all of the oxygen present. And anoxic dead zones um, are, you know, they're not just confined to these sort of beaches or things like that. They can happen over huge amounts of areas. And the most sort of globally famous um, type of, of dead zone is actually the Mississippi River um, 
dead zone. And this occurs um, pretty much every summer as agriculture ramps up along the Mississippi River. So the Mississippi River itself drains into the Gulf of Mexico through Mississippi. And uh, the idea being in winter, there's not a lot of agriculture going on in the Midwest up here. So there's not a lot of nitrogen and there's not a lot of phytoplankton. But when agricultural product production ramps up, there's lots of nitrogen making it into the Mississippi River. A lot of that nitrogen makes it into the Gulf of Mexico here, stimulating the production of phytoplankton. And eventually you stimulate too much, um, you'll cause a bloom of the algae and ultimately will make these areas that you see where there's tons of algae eventually go completely anoxic. And as you can see, this is a pretty massive stretch of the, of the coast here of, of say potentially Texas as well as Mississippi as a whole. And so it's a particularly huge problem. It can be a sort of a widespread issue in these areas. And again, if you have large scale algal blooms, it causes wide scale reductions in oxygen, which cause large, large scale death in fish, crabs, and so on and so forth. Um, but you can look at what happens in the summer oxygen. You see, again, large scale um, <clears throat> depletions in oxygen on, over a very large stretch of the Gulf of Mexico here. And, it, and so sort of directly tied to this idea of harmful algal blooms is actually we're using the microbes in wastewater treatment. And, and we can use microbes to remove nitrogen pollution before it enters our coastal waters. And so we have, there's a bunch of different types of, of nitrogen pollution removal as well as wastewater treatment. Um, but there, there's such as preliminary treatments, primary treatments, um, which remove solid debris and as well as sediment. And so there's a whole sort of, uh, of uh, ways we can do this. Uh, we also have what are called secondary treatments where we use microbial, microbes to treat and eliminate organic matter. We have aerobic treatments such as bacteria, such as zooglia, uh, flavobacterium, pseudomonas, and notocardia. We can also have it be done by ciliates, amoeba, nematodes, and rotifers. We also have anaerobic treatment by methanogens and denitrifiers to remove that reactive nitrogen, release methane, and we can actually, use, we can actually recover that methane as a fuel, again, natural gas. Uh, we can also have a, what's called a tertiary treatment to kill pathogens as, as well. Um, ultimately, we release these into rivers or potentially directly into the ocean. And so we, wastewater treatment plants, um, <clears throat> You know, they sort of have this, uh, mul again, this multi-step process, preliminary, primary, secondary, and tertiary, eventually leading to uh, outwash into, say, a stream or the ocean itself. Again, these are what we call municipal wastewater treatment plants. Basically, all your, you know, all your poop and pee every day goes to one of these treatment plants. Um, what this does is it essentially leads to a reduction in the amount of nutrients present, so essentially allows this wastewater to make it out into the natural environment, um, to be and be less uh, deleterious to the environment, cause less algal blooms, things like that. But there are natural treatments, and these are particular things are wetlands that allow a filtering of water before it enters, say, the coast or before it enters a river. Because wetlands have a very low water uh, flow through them, it allows the bacteria in the wetlands to actually clean the water. So it does what these waste, these municipal treatment plants um, do, and do it in a much more natural way. But that being said, these municipal treatment plants are super duper important for keeping our coastal waters, keeping our natural waters much more clean. Um, and the one we all know here in Boston is actually Deer Island. You probably, you know, probably don't think about it very much, but this is what Deer Island looks like. And so if you go anywhere near the coast, you'll see Deer Island and you'll see these giant eggs off the coast of Massachusetts. And these are massive microbial bioreactors and essentially treats all of Boston's wastewater by removing nutrients and capturing the methane, which we then ultimately use as a fuel to essentially power this whole wastewater treatment plant. And you can see it's, it's huge. It's, I mean, these eggs are you know, 80, 90 feet tall. So Deer Island is pretty huge. Um, and so we do take advantage of, of our microbes in these eggs as well as in these industrial plazas over here to treat all the wastewater of Boston so that we can actually then pump it out into the ocean. And I, I will mention they don't pump the, the, the wastewater from Deer Island directly into Boston Harbor. They pump it about six or seven miles off the coast. There's a sort of a huge uh, uh, pipe that runs out from here. So um, with that, we'll just summarize uh, this uh, last part. Um, so microbes do a lot for us outside of making our bodies work and controlling our ecosystems. And microbes make industrial and medically important compounds that can often be life-saving. These include things like insulin and antibiotics. And don't forget microbes um, treat our waste for us, making our, making our lives better and making us healthier, as well as making our waters healthier as well.
And so with that, that's going to be the end of our course. I hope you all have learned something. I hope you all have enjoyed um, taking a deep dive into what our microbes do for us. Um, there's not, there's, there's no shortage of cool things microbes are going to do for us, you know, that are do for us that we haven't covered in this course. And there's going to be no shortage of things that microbes do for us going forward. So I suggest, um, and I hope that, you know, this course sort of sparked of interest with you and you keep up with all the cool things microbes do for you. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, but I hope you all are being safe and take care.